everyone. My name is uh, Heath Mayo. I am the founder of Principles First, a group that uh, holds similar convenings like this one. Um, and I'm delighted to be here this evening uh, talking about these issues with all of you and with our uh, distinguished guests. Um, the, the, the name of this panel is focusing on the Trump indictments. And while we won't go in this discussion into the, the facts, we, I think we all know the facts at this point. Um, they've, they've been out there for quite some time. Uh, we will focus, I think, on the, uh, the, the prosecutorial decisions that were made leading up to these indictments, um, the, the unprecedented nature of them, and why um, you know, the DOJ and other prosecutors made the right decision, uh, and, and how these indictments uh, and, and cases will, will continue. I'm joined on the stage today by Mr. Stuart Gerson. Um, who was the acting attorney general for the uh, civil division, or attorney general for the civil division uh, under uh, President H.W. Bush, uh, and then later acting attorney general under President Clinton. He is the board treasurer uh, for the Society of the Rule of Law. And I'm also here with Mr. Donald Ayer, um, who was uh, appointed by President Reagan as a U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of California, um, was later assistant attorney, deputy attorney general under uh, President H.W. Bush as well. Um, I, I, I brought my phone up here because I wanted to just hone in on the threat. Uh, you know, the, the last panel was about the threat that the courts face, corruption in the courts, and the attacks that it, it, it's facing. This obviously is about prosecutors in the indictments. And, and the threat here, I think, sums up uh, is summed up in the statement that uh, President Trump released after he uh, was indicted. And, and I'll just read it. These thugs have just indicated the 45th President of the United States of America. And, I mean, it, it's, it's funny, but this really, when we talk about the threat, this is the threat. And the leading Republican candidate by far for the 2024 nomination for President. All caps. This is an attack on our country the likes of which has never been seen before. The USA is now a third world nation, a nation in serious decline, so sad. <laughs> I, I, I start with that because we chuckle, it's funny, but what he's saying there is that prosecutors, the DOJ, the line attorneys that enforce our laws uh, have sent the country on a partisan political witch hunt. They can't be trusted and our entire system is on the ropes. I, I, I throw that and I set the stage. Any thoughts on that, Stuart? Well, forgive me for, <clears throat> for being a little autobiographical, and I'll show you why in a, sec in a second. I was a prosecutor once, and I, like most prosecutors, believed that we could get our mothers convicted if we went about it. Uh, indeed, <laughs> in, in, indeed, uh, I obtained a conviction of a sitting United States Senator. The case went up to the Supreme Court and was, was affirmed. So you have that certain ego. Prosecutors think they can prosecute, then they do it almost uh, unelected prosecutors, United States attorney type of prosecutors, do it irrespective of politics. But I don't want to talk as much about prosecutors as I want to talk about citizens in general and how it is that they have to receive judgments in, in cases to make them what's known in the trade as durable, respected, useful precedents. And let me talk about three people. The, the first is Benjamin Franklin, who famously was asked after the, Constitution, after the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, what have you given us? He was asked it by a woman. He said, Madam, I've, we've given you a republic if you can keep it. Uh, I think then of one of the great influences in my life, President George H.W. Bush. Uh, I grew up in a small town. If you ever told me I'd get to know somebody and become a friend of somebody who was the President of the United States, I'd have thought that was a, an absolute fantasy, but it turned out that it's true. Uh, when I was asked by President Clinton, uh, out of party, to be the acting attorney general with prospects, that I, as was the case, that I'd be there for quite a while because they were having trouble finding and getting confirmed an attorney general of their own. He, I asked President Bush, I called him on the phone, I, we would talk often while I, while I was in office, and I, I said, is this gonna embarrass you at all? You know, I'm, I'm a conservative, I'll be in another administration. And, and he said, what are you talking about? Uh, country always 
comes before party. And then I think of Walt Kelly. You don't remember Walt Kelly. Walt Kelly was the cartoonist of the famous Pogo strip. And he's the person who had Pogo say with a tear in his eye, we have met the enemy and he is us. And when I look at the prospects for prosecution with the vanity of an ex-prosecutor thinking uh, that in a couple of these cases at least, uh, I believe that I could secure the conviction of Donald Trump. What's important to me as, as a citizen is how will that be accepted by the society at large? And that's what we're here to talk about. How do we make decisions and judgments like that durable? How do we think of the 40% of the population uh, that uh, is bound to somebody who we think has no place constitutionally uh, uh, under the 14th Amendment or otherwise again, ever again to hold public office? And the, the state of civics education is, is low. And it's our job to explain what the rule of law means explain to the people uh, who are of working class and, and, and uh, whose futures are questionable to them because of technology, they're suspicious of, of immigrants and minorities, they have these idiot theories like replacement theory and, 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 and the like of that. And you know, what, do, what, do we have to, what do we have to say to them? And that, that's what our job is, to talk about the rule of law, to talk about the fact that uh, uh, to to talk about what the framers really feared. George Washington was given the opportunity to become a king. We didn't want to have that. We didn't want uh, authoritarianism. It, it's not just the US trend. I mean, look at Turkey, at India, at uh, Hungary, and countries all over the place. And why are we seeing uh, a, a trend towards autocracy? We could spend a lot of time talking about the future of work, talking about how people are invested in their society. <laughs> But it's our job to say uh, that ordinary people are going to do a lot worse uh, under an autocratic government. These people style themselves, and the press unfortunately styles them as conservative. There's nothing conservative about them. I'm a conservative. Uh, Mike Ludic is a conservative. Jurisprudentially and governmentally, we believe in limited government. These MAGAs don't believe in that at all. They believe in an intrusive, pervasive government dictating what you do with your lives and what you think and what you can say. It's, it's our job to speak out about that and to speak out about the rule of law and why that gives you a better life. I'd, I'd like to get back to just uh, giving a, maybe a slightly different perspective on the prosecutions here because I, I've, I've, these panels before us have been very interesting and, and I think also identifying some real problems. We're all well aware of the problems, but fleshing out the, the, the problems of the rule of law. And um, I, I guess what I'm actually finding somewhat encouraging now about the prosecutions is that they're finally now engaged. Um, and the rule of law is, in this context, finally rolling forward. It's been a very all of you who've been paying attention, and I think everybody in this room has been paying attention, um, it's been an amazing process. I can remember listening to podcasts um, probably two years ago. Some, there are people in this room who were on them, and the sentiment being expressed in the podcasts was that there really couldn't ever be prosecutions of Donald Trump. It just really was highly unlikely to ever happen. Um, and a lot of people felt that. And of course we have, uh, you know, we have the tradition of not indicting um, uh, President Nixon. Um, and people argue about that, and is that right, is that wrong? Um, uh, and, and I think we all know that there's a risk, you know, we don't want to be a banana republic. Um, we don't want to, you know, have the next administration come in and bash the former administration. Um, uh, but, you know, we've gone through an amazing process in this country. The, the government and the authority of the government can't be invoked in, in a proper way. The rule of law isn't consistent with the government 
invoking its authority in a summary way, in an arbitrary way, and it certainly isn't compatible with the high officials of the government as, as Bill Barr and the, Trump, and, and the Trump administration did in the context of investigations that were designed to influence the election, doing running commentary on people when uh, the government hasn't stepped up to bringing charges. So the idea that this whole question of will we, won't we uh, charge Donald Trump and with what and, and will it succeed, it's been a mystery. It's been a mystery for a long time. Um, and I guess uh, what I am seeing now, and, and in, a, in a way to me it's, um, it's a gratifying ch chance to say here at the end of this program or near the end of this program, keep your fingers crossed, but, but we may now be at the point where the system having engaged, it knows how to do its job. Its job is to fairly try and prosecute people. And nothing could be more important when you analyze the offenses uh, that there is ample evidence here. I'm not going to say, you know, tell what the jury what to do, but the evidence that we're all aware of from the hearings, from the, from the congressional hearings, uh, from other things we read, from the great work that our reporters have done on what the facts are. There's so much evidence that this person um, basically set up a system and was the lead person to overturn the election. And then there's ample evidence of a much simpler but almost a serious case of basically just taking government documents, secret government documents, government secrets, we don't know what they are, but they were secret for a reason, um, and hanging on to them, and then when asked for them back, no, let's not give them back. Let's figure out ways to hide them. Um, so the system here has engaged, and there's a lot more that has to happen. Um, and there are a lot of reasons we could, I'm sure a lot of us could sit around and wonder whether you know, Merrick Garland played it just right in terms of how fast he moved on things, or there, there's a lot of, of room to talk about things. But the fact of the matter is, we are where we are, and the system's moving forward. And I, it, it looks to me as though we've got a good shot, at least with most of the judges in these cases, including, I'm thinking of state court in Georgia primarily, and of course, uh, Judge Chutkin here in DC, uh, that, that this is gonna be handled well, and that we're going to get to something that will be all we have any right to have. And that's a fair trial on the merits. And that's the ultimate thing. And I guess the last thought I want to just throw out is that um, I cannot imagine, given what it appears, and we're all aware of the chaos that Donald Trump wrought, and, and the things that the evidence indicates seem to have occurred, um, I cannot imagine a more important set of litigations um, for the rule of law to grind away on and reach a fair and just conclusion on than these. And the consequences um, that I hope will flow from those are some education for some part of the population, hopefully enough to nudge us in a different direction. So I'm thinking and I'm hoping that we're seeing right now, it's, it's not always pretty, uh, but we're seeing the rule of law at work and even though it's faced enormous challenges, starting with we, we've never indicted a former president, can you really do that? Um, and, and how do you do it when there's so much complicated uh, factual material to deal with? Um, we're moving toward it and we're getting close to it and I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to get where we need to be and that in this instance, the rule of law may well be triumphant. Don mentioned the documents case, and it spurred in my mind another request that I have for you. Take away with you the idea that one of the principles that we're describing here is that this argument about the so-called weaponization of justice is nonsense. When you look at the documents case and you hear people in the, in the legislature saying somehow uh, that the mechanisms of justice are being directed uh, against uh, Republicans. Uh, think of the documents case and then think of David Petraeus 
Sandy Berger, John Deutsch, all prosecuted under the same statute. Uh, you can find examples of that throughout American jurisprudence. Uh, but, you know, we have a message. I, uh, President Bush, as, as uh, I think George uh, said in, in his introduction, had, had this phrase about a thousand points of light, and it was his, his idea, his thought that, uh, that we could inspire. And uh, some of us who would get together with him would joke and say, uh, what we really need is to get out to the people, not with a thousand points of light, but with a, th with a thousand pints of light. <laughs> and, and maybe that's what we need to do. Uh, we don't have an ivory tower message here. Uh, what, we're, what we're talking about here in terms of the rule of law is that not only is nobody above it, nobody's below it either. It, it, it's, it, it's for everybody. We're talking about an ordered society. Uh, the professor spoke about uh, uh, originalism as, as, a, as a check on the judiciary, as a limiting principle. That's what the rule of law does. It's a limiting principle on, on, on conduct. Keeps us as an orderly society, moving ahead, progressing get us out into space, get, proliferate, uh, uh, be fair. Uh, I mean, one of the things that kind of intrigues me about these cases as they're going forward is the way the rule of law, which is to say there, there is an order that's being imposed on a situation, um, the way that is in tension, very great tension with the way that an autocrat or a, or a demagogue presents themselves. Um, and in the case of our former president, he has always presented himself, and it's always been, I think, maybe at the heart of his primary appeal to a lot of his supporters, that he is above and free of any restraints from any higher authority. It, it's the notion that nobody can tell him what to do, He's absolutely immune. That's his legal doctrinal sort of way of expressing that thought. Um, and, uh, and, and there are, for reasons I've never grasped, maybe some of you have, um, a whole lot of people for whom that assertion of this autonomy and this, this sort of ability to float above everything and everybody and above the rules that most of us think we're governed by um, that has a great attraction for him. And one of the gratifying things, one of the big gratifying things to me, and, and something of a reassurance, I don't think any of us at this point, I'm sort of declaring victory here, and I can't declare victory because we're not there yet, but um, I, I think one of the gratifying prospects, I guess I'll say, is the possibility and the likelihood perhaps that um, as these cases go forward, we're already seeing it, I think, in, in, in with Judge Engeron and the, and the, uh, the case this week and, and in his interactions, if you can call them that, with Judge Chutkin. Um, we're seeing a person who doesn't like anybody to be telling him what to do or putting him in a place and saying, sit there or stand there or do this or do that. Um, and yet that's inherent in the rule of law and it's inherent in the process that he is now engaged in. And along with that process going forward and the hopefully timely, meaning well before the election, adjudication of at least one of these most important cases, um, we're going to be seeing this phenomenon of this wannabe autonomous person above all forms of authority in a place where he can't be uh, above all forms of authority. And part of what may grow out of that is a sense that he isn't entirely the person that he presents himself as. And I think that's fair because he, whether like it or not, he does live in a society that, by golly, is under the rule of law, and being under the rule of law means that you can't flaunt all authority. And so I feel like even before there's any verdict in any of these cases, whatever it will be, we're seeing a process that is transformative 
for the public um, of who this person is and whether he can really be the person that he claims to be and that is, I guess, so attractive to many of his supporters. And just to, just to follow up on, on, on the themes that you both have raised, and, and, and actually, you know, the outburst from the, from the gentleman brings this to mind. I mean, there is, there, there's an essence of this that is, the damage is done to some extent. I mean, there's this distrust out there in the public about prosecutors, about courts, and, I mean, obviously we want the prosecutors to follow the law, follow where it goes, follow the facts where they lead, and, and sort of prosecute and follow these things without fear or favor. But, but what can we do as lawyers, as practitioners, um, and, and to those who are watching, judges on the court, what can we do to build confidence that these aren't witch hunts, that even though, you, because, I mean, you've heard statements from Trump. I mean, his candidacy now is about retribution. And while these cases right now are unprecedented, if he is elected, there's a high likelihood that the line prosecutors that he puts into place are, are, are going to use these cases to some degree as precedential uh, to go after their opponents in ways that hasn't, you know, we haven't seen before. What, did, what should we be doing in this moment to, to address that problem? We're doing it right now. That's, that's, that's why we're here. That's, that's, why, that's, why we're ask, that's why we're asking you to, to carry the word. Go forth. Uh, look, we're, we're, we're constructively at war with at least four countries in, in, in the world. People's Republic of China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. I deal a lot in cybersecurity and national security issues in my, in my practice. Let me assure you that these countries are benefiting from our, from our disorder. They're exploiting it. And they're not doing it just in a way that it has to do with meddling in our, in our elections. They're setting up commercial alliances in, in Africa and other parts of the world. They're cornering uh, sensitive uh, minerals. Uh, they're, they're creating alliances. They're weakening us with, with uh, uh, our, our ability to support our allies. Uh, they're doing things that they think will tire us out. Uh, and we're doing a lot to tire ourselves out by having debates about some of the, some of the things we have here. The national existence, that republic that Benjamin Franklin talked about, is at stake here. Yeah. And we need to understand that. And that's a far greater issue than whether uh, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment uh, uh, will bar Donald Trump ever from, from holding public office again. Uh, I mean, I, I feel like we all have to conduct ourselves in a... In a upright and principled way and, and in personal integrity and honesty is absolutely essential um, and prosecutors must do that too. Um, but th there's uh, one, of the, one of the great frustrations for me of the last few years is descending into a fact-free world um, and getting into the position where um, you know, I guess a lot of it is technological. A lot of it is we all live in our phones, and you, you people choose because they have to. They choose their sources of information. So your truth may not be my truth, and there are different truths in a sense, in the sense that what you receive over the airwaves. But there are facts, and, and our system of justice depends upon there being objectively verifiable facts. It's challenging today to assert even to assert and try to make stick the idea that there are verifiable facts. But there have to be, and that has to be our position, and it has to be the burden that we undertake. And I'm optimistic after all the work that's been done on these issues and on these facts that we have a pretty large and substantial and thorough and accurate sense of an awful lot of facts that bear on what occurred so that there are going to be people, there are going to be Trump supporters and others probably who are going to say, oh, no, this isn't true, this isn't fair, it's a plot, et cetera, et cetera. But at some point, you have to be satisfied with the fact that it's not. It's not a plot. It's thoroughly documented. The facts are there. The proof is there. The jury finds the proof to be there. And that's our system. And doubting, doubting that and doubting ourselves and doubting our system and doubting our ability, I'm glad that 
Stewart feels confident he can prove this to a jury, because I think other people think they can prove it to a jury too, because the facts are so clear and strong. And we all have to take, we have to scrutinize, be sure we're right, but as Davy Crockett said, then go ahead. Um, and I think in this case, those facts are there, and, and facts are what should matter when it comes to the rules of law that are being applied. Uh, Stuart, before this began, you, had meant, you, you brought up Section 3, and, and you mentioned um, that, that you had thought a lot about the, the nexus between these indictments and ultimately the constitutional arguments um, about Trump's eligibility for the presidency. Um, Judge Ludig has wrote uh, on this, and there's been a lot of talk out there about the applicability. Does the absence of that charge in the indictments, you know, how does that, how does that bode for the constitutional arguments, and, and how do you see that playing out in, in the courts? Yeah, well, Mike Ludig and my, my friend Larry Tribe have, have, have written and, and spoken about, about this issue, and I, I, I have too, and the, there's not a great gap between us. I, the special counsel, Smith, was very careful in, in aligning the charges that, that, that he brought, and so have some of the other courts, and some of these cases are better than other cases. But none of them are charging uh, anybody, including the defeated ex-president, with insurrection or rebellion, the terms used in Section 3. Uh, I don't think there's a serious question, uh, just based on, on common sense, and uh, we were all talking about this earlier, uh, that a president or an ex-president uh, is, uh, uh, is not subject to, to Section 3. Uh, that, that's an argument that just doesn't make any sense. But the fact is that while many think, including Judge Ludic, that uh, Section 3 is self-executing. I think there needs to be a predicate for it to be executed. Uh, and that will either, it, it likely will lie in a court decision of some kind. I'm, it's an unfortunate fact, but I'm gratified to see that there are some people with, a, with act, actual standing to uh, uh, litigate cases like this, and they're elections commissioners or, or state officials that put people on the ballot. And there's at least one case in, in Colorado uh, where um, uh, the Trump forces have, have sought a declaratory judgment that uh, Trump belongs on the, on the Colorado ballot. And so there's going to be a real, there's at least one real case out there where this can be decided. But a court is going to have to decide whether the provable conduct of, uh, of, of uh, uh, Donald Trump uh, amounted to insurrection and rebellion. Rebellion is a, is, is, is a, uh, a difficult concept. Insurrection much less so, I think. Uh, I, I, to just paraphrase Don, I think the, 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 evidence, the evidence is there. Uh, but there'll be a judicial battle, and that's what it'll be about if, if, uh, if ever we get to the point that uh, Section 3 is sought to be applied. Just real quick, one, one thing that, that worries me about Section 3 as a, an avenue, and I think it's fine that they're litigating it, and I'd love to see it somehow work, but I don't understand how there can ever be an actual removal, uh, uh, will ever be a removal of Donald Trump from the ballot in any, in any place until the merits of that question are resolved by the Supreme Court. Um, and I, because I think they would stay, and even if you got a ruling in Colorado that said, no, you can't be on the ballot, it would be stayed pending a final resolution of that federal issue by the Supreme Court. And I don't know how that happens before the election. So I'm not quite sure how this is. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that, that it does. But to pick up on a, another point that you, a very valid point that you made, uh, there is a tremendous amount of information that has entered the public wheel. There are some people who won't believe it. Uh, confirmation bias is, a, is, is an infectious disease. But uh, there's enough out there that uh, people are going to see this. Um, it, it's going to affect election. It's going to affect election conduct. I mean, we've seen it in the states. We've seen it uh, uh, in, in by-election after by-election where Trump-backed candidates are failing. And... This is why. So it, again, just to pick up on, on Walt Kelly, it's, it's, it's us. You know, uh, we, we, the, we the people really means we the people. And uh, we, need to, we need to be engaged. Uh, Professor Amar talked about uh, the ills of, of primaries and uh, the fact that we have too many candidates or, or too many legislators uh, and, and others who are afraid of being primaried. 
The real problem with the primary system is we're not engaged enough in the society that enough people are voting in them. And so only the most committed people on the left and the right are voting in primaries, and we're getting some horrible out-of-sync candidates on both far ends of, 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 the, of, the, of the political continuum. So it's going to come down to us. Uh, Benjamin Franklin was right. It's a, it's a republic if we can keep it. And that, that's our job. That's our job here tonight. And it's your job in carrying this message uh, further from here. Thanks for that uh, great last panel. All of the speakers were absolutely terrific. I'm Alan Rawl, member of the board of the Society for the Rule of Law, former uh, Reagan White House lawyer. I do want to just note as a matter of uh, personal privilege that on the board of the Society for the Rule of Law and the Advisory Council, there are four former Reagan White House counsel lawyers, Mike Ludig, Peter Keisler, Michael Shepard, myself. And uh, Jay Stevens, uh, uh, the boss of some of us uh, in the White House Counsel's Office, was here uh, earlier in support in the, in the audience. I don't think that's a uh, coincidence. Um, so uh, this has been a fantastic relaunch tonight of the uh, Checks and Balances group that George Conway talked about that we founded in 2018. Thanks to George and the other brilliant speakers tonight for their uh, terrific inspiration for our mission, which is to defend democracy, uphold the rule of law, regardless of person or, or party uh, in power. Uh, as was stated earlier, we're, uh, our, our intent is to help establish and foster a community of conservative and center-right uh, lawyers who are dedicated to, to democracy, regardless of uh, party. And we're now very well positioned to keep fighting that good fight uh, due to the, the uh, efforts of the leadership of the, the former checks and balances and our partnership with Longwell partner Sarah Longwell and, and her terrific team. We've got terrific resources available to us and great organization. The standing room audience uh, for tonight's program and all of you coming and enjoying yourselves here and listening to this intellectual uh, uh, feast uh, is testament uh, to that. So um, at this point, I would beseech you to stay involved. Visit our website, uh, societyfortherulelaw.org. You know, it's, uh, it's uh, what candidates do when they go on TV. They always mention their website, right? Societyfortherulelaw.org. Every one of those letters counts. Uh, you know, as, uh, as, as Judge Ludig said uh, earlier, the time has come uh, really for a, a new conservative uh, legal movement, uh, and uh, we are the ones that uh, we've been waiting for and Judge uh, Ludig has been waiting for. So uh, at this point, I thank you for coming. I would uh, say there's still time for you to enjoy yourselves together uh, at the reception here. Uh, and uh, stay involved with us. We're going to have conferences, we're going to have events, we're going to have video uh, meetings, so we're going to write, uh, continue to write op-eds, we're going to sign amicus briefs, uh, and so make your suggestions, get involved, join the membership of the Society of the Rule of Law at the website that you now know by heart, Society for the Rule of Law. And with that, thank you very much for coming.